If I didn't know better, sitting here all day long, I'd think that we have a problem in this country. <laughs> Maybe we have two or three problems in this country. And uh, I was speaking to a group of uh, fifth graders last Friday, and, and it occurs to me that our problem is a bicycle problem. Think about that for a second. We created a system and it was supposed to operate as a system. I'm so grateful for the, uh, the comments that James had at lunch. He said, we have a document. We have a document that was unprecedented in the history of this world. Unprecedented. Where for the very first time, we created a system where there were two sovereign governments over the same people in the same territory. It never happened before. We also created a system where the rights derive from the people. But it was created as a system and yet we tend to look at it in isolation. And as we do that, we're going to continue to perpetuate the problem. Now, what we're talking about here in this summit with this bill and all of the great things that Larry and so many others are doing is what James called an antidote. It's one way of trying to put shackles on that tire that's about to burst. It's one way. And granted, I mean, I worked with Larry way before the, the legislation ever came to the floor. We worked very diligently on this all the way through. I'm, 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 I'm all over this personally and as, as a legislative approach. But, but here's our system problem. It reminds me of, well, let me just go here. If you remember nothing else, remember this. Where there's no line, there's no limit. Where there's no limit, ultimately there's no liberty. Is 15 trillion the line? How about 20 trillion? Is, is putting 43% of our government, the cost of our government, off to our children the line? How about 53%? How about 73%? When does it become our Nuremberg moment that we say, no, 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 this is my responsibility. I can no longer say, uh, it's not my job. The higher-ups ordered this. At, at what point do we cross that line? For me, I crossed it a long time ago. When I ran for office, the first time I ran for office, I didn't want to do this. I still don't want to be here, quite frankly. Um, I would much rather go grow carrots and raise chickens and go up in the mountains somewhere and live the nice quiet life. I want to be Dave's neighbor someday. Um, seriously, I mean, I'm not joking on that. But I have four kids and I have a, we have a job to do and I cannot bear the thought of what's coming to them. But th there was a great debate that Thomas uh, Hutchison, the royal governor of Massachusetts, had with John Adams in 1773. And they were talking about this self-governance, the ability to govern themselves in the, in the colonies. And Hutchison said to Adams, he said, there can be no line between the supreme authority of Parliament or the independence of the colonies. And Adams shot right back. It's actually a later slide. No, there it is. How about that? He shot right back and said, if there be no such line, we must be mere vassals or we must be totally independent. Now, in our system, they created a line. And it's a, it's a, it's, it's a oh, no, here it is right here. This, we started out with this. Now, we know that our founders, when they set this up, said that they knew it was the nature and disposition of government to amass unbridled power. That's what government does. Government does what it can. Unchecked, government does what it can. They knew that. They studied all human history. They knew that. And so they said, we need checks and balances. We're going we're to develop this network of checks and balances. And yet, for 80, maybe 100 years, this is all we're taught, right? Fifth grade, eighth grade, twelfth grade. University level, law school, executive, legislative, judicial, give me the gold star, I know checks and balances. <laughs> right? James Wilson and so many others, I mean, we could pull so many quotes on this, but James Wilson, one of the major drafters of the Constitution, said this Constitution deserves praise for the accuracy with which we drew the line between the powers of the general government and those of the particular state governments. They were drawn as, min as, as minutely enumerated and defined as was possible as language would allow. And so our system of government is not what we see in fifth grade and eighth grade and executive, legislative, judicial, the triangle, and I know government. This is our system. Remember James Madison in Federalist 51? He said, in a single republic, this is checks and balances. In the compound republic of America, however, the power surrendered by the people is first divided among two distinct governments, and they control each other as a double security to the rights of the people. Is that not what we're talking about? The security to our liberty, our liberty to work and preserve the value, our liberty to, to pursue happiness, to gain the benefits of our labor. 
Isn't that what we're talking about? Well, that's what our system was designed to be. And not only this, in fact, I, I love this. Uh, this is what our system was. This is in Federalist 45. Powers delegated to the federal government, few and defined. Those reserved to the states, numerous and indefinite. And so not only do we never teach this in school, we only teach this. We don't even teach the balance. It's not a balance between the states and the federal government. It's this. Now what happens is we want to stamp our feet. We want to get our hair on fire and get all upset. The federal government. It's just doing what government does. I mean, it's 16-year-olds with whiskey in the car keys. <laughs> I mean, come on, write the rest of the story. It's just what they do. Now, the problem is, in our system, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? This was a great, I love this quote. This is our last Democrat governor. This is not a partisan issue. It's systemic. It's jurisdictional. Federalism is not a partisan issue. It's not an issue dividing liberals and conservatives. It's a philosophical concept about how our government system operates, an effort to determine the proper role of state and federal governments. He goes to quote Madison that said, if the states were abolished, the federal government would be compelled by the principle of self-preservation to reinstate them in their proper jurisdiction. When I asked the fifth graders about the bicycle, I said, I said, I'm here to talk to you about the Constitution, but let's talk about bicycles. And they all perked up. I said, well, what would happen if we keep riding that bicycle like that? Oh, man, you'll break the chain, you'll snap the cranks, the tire, the rubber will come off the tire, you'll bend up the rims. How hard would it be to fix it if we allow it to go there? Oh, God, I don't know if you could fix it. It would cost a lot of money to try to fix it if you did that. Well, how hard would it be to fix right now if we just look at the system? Well, that'd be easy. You just blow this tire up a little bit and take a little bit of air out of that one. There you go. Are we smarter than a fifth grader? <laughs> really, are we smarter than a fifth grader? This is where we're at now. Oh, no, that's, oh, here's your quiz for the day, okay? Here's your quiz. Who said this? Congress has been given the right to legislate on particular subjects, but this is not the case in a great number of other vital problems of government, such as the conduct of public utilities, banks, insurance, business, agriculture, education, social welfare, a dozen other important features, and these Washington must not interfere. How many of you would sign on to that statement? <laughs> right? Who said that? FDR. FDR, you saw my bookmark, right? <laughs> <laughs> Franklin Delano, governor. Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now here's why that's important. For 150 years, we knew where the line was. We knew that there was a line, and we knew where it was. Now, at this point in time, 1930, when he said this, any idea what federal spending was as a percentage of GDP? Three percent. Three percent. For 150 years, get that, for 150 years, we became the most productive, the most powerful economic engine the world had ever seen with a federal government operating on 3% of GDP. You know what it is today? Somewhere between 23 and 26%. Now add to that the cost of federal regulation. In a 2008 study, now I understand there was a regulation or two added since 2008. <laughs> Maybe, right? In 2008, the cost of complying with federal regulation was nearly $2 trillion. So in addition to the 26% of GDP, we're taking a backpack and putting 2 trillion rocks in it, giving it to our business and say, go ahead, go compete. And we're going to take 26% of GDP on top of that. Where's the line? 26%? $2 trillion in regulation? This is where we are today, right? Here's what Jefferson said about it. He said, he said, we must strengthen the state governments. We can't do this by any change in the Constitution because it's the mere preservation of the Constitution is all that we need to contend for. It must be done by the states themselves erecting barriers at the constitutional line that cannot be surmounted. And John Dickinson gave us this warning. He said, the government of each state is and is to be sovereign and supreme in all matters that relate to each state only, and to be subordinate barely in those matters that relate to the whole, and it will be their own faults if the several states suffer the federal sovereignty to interfere in the things of their respective jurisdictions, like education, like preserving the purchasing power of our earnings and savings. So how do we do that? How do we do that? 
Um, I asked in a prior panel, and I'd asked this question all across the nation. We've got a few state representatives here. David, right? Is it David? I'm sorry. Yeah. Kendall. Kendall, I'm sorry. Kendall. Kendall and Peter. How many people on your campaign committee? How many people did it take to walk neighborhoods, to make phone calls, to pound signs? How many people on your campaign committee to elect a state representative, state senator? Well, in my district, it was basically three of them. Three of them. How about you? Several, probably about five. What would you do if you had ten people? Celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Think about this, 10 people, now, across the nation, pretty much average across the nation, to elect a state representative who understands that it's his duty, swore an oath under Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution. Imagine that, 4,500 words in the Constitution, 4,500 words, and they say the members of the state legislatures shall be bound by oath or affirmation to uphold this Constitution. Why? What power? What right? What duty? It's the other tire. It's the other tire. Now, we can keep being drawn to Washington, as Jefferson said. When all things are drawn to Washington, in small as in great things, foreign and domestic, it will render powerless the checks of one government on another and become as venal and oppressive as the government from which we separated. Ten people to walk neighborhoods, pound signs, make phone calls, elect your state representative, who understands that it's his duty, as James Madison said, in introducing the Bill of Rights to Congress. State legislatures will jealously and closely watch the operations of this government and be able to resist with more effect every assumption of power, better than any power on earth can do, because they are the sure guardians of the people's liberty. And we can do that much better with the repeal of the 17th. With or without that. Yeah. Now that's where you look at Federalist 28, you look at Federalist 46, because the, state, the states have the ability to act together. It said they will be able to recognize the danger at a distance. They have the organs of civil power. They have the confidence of the people. They will be able to unite their common forces in defense of their common liberty. That's why when we go back to that other slide, we go back to this slide, it's not one state against the federal government balancing in this governing partnership. It's the states collectively. They had what they called the committees of correspondence. I'm sorry, I'm probably way over on time. How are we doing? Are we okay? The states, think about this for a second, 1770, okay, let's go back there, Boston Massacre. They'd already had the Stamp, the, the, uh, the stamp Act, right? They were, they were hacked. They were hacked. But at the Boston Massacre, they didn't declare independence of the Boston Massacre. I mean, come on, the British Army, the most well-equipped, well-trained, well-funded, and in fact, they were loyal, they considered themselves loyal British subjects. What they did was they formed the Committees of Correspondence, and together, they sent petitions to the federal government in an effort to communicate, cooperate, coordinate, cons consult with this government as, as good faith governments would do. For six years they sent petition after petition, delegation after delegation, until 1776 they realized it was inevitable what they needed to do. They sat down Jefferson to draft the Declaration of Independence and he went to Benjamin Franklin and he said, hey, would you get on your iPad, Ben, and see what long train of abuses might be and research that out a little bit and tell me what you think? Right? For six years, they'd been living it. They had documented it. They had built a public record. They had shined sunlight on that line and where that line needed to be. They didn't need to research it. They had built their common resolve in acting together, standing at that line. Let me just tell you in Utah then, and we'll talk about what we do, and, and I'll finish. In Utah, we passed a bill along with this Utah Legal Tender Act this, this session, which is one leg of a many-legged stool, but the bill was called House Bill 76, Federal Law Evaluation and Response. So in Utah, as the external check, if men were angels, no government is necessary. If angels were to govern, we wouldn't need internal and external checks, right? It's our job. So as the external check, not bound by the Supreme Court, not bound by the federal government itself, as the external check, the sure guardian of our people's liberty, we define the constitutional line in our statute. And that constitutional line is the powers delegated to the federal government as amended. Imagine that. These are your powers. We're going to watch you on these powers. And then we formed a federalism subcommittee. We funded it with $1.6 million. That's how serious we are. Because this is costing us millions and millions and millions of dollars to deal with the wolves and the gnat catchers and the prairie dogs and the Clean Water Act, where a 12-inch wide rivulet in the middle of a desert is navigable waters to regulate all the land, where the Department of Transportation wants to tell farmers they have to have a CDL license and be 21 years old to operate a tractor on a farm. This is the kinds of things we're dealing with every day, spending millions of dollars. So we funded this, staffed it, and our federalism committee looks at all federal action defined as legislation, agency action, executive orders against that constitutional line. 
And if they cross the line, we go through that same good faith governing process that the original colonies did. Communication, cooperation, coordination, consultation, as good faith governments do. Now in standing at that line, they may blow us off. In fact, they do frequently. Now that's good information. It's not pleasant information, but it's good information to know now that we've diagnosed the nature of our governing partnership, are we really partners? Are we really partners? And have we shined sunlight on that? And have we built the public record? Have we built our resolve to the point that we know that it's inevitable what needs to be done? No, we haven't done that. We haven't stood at that line. We stamp our feet a lot. Say, man, I hate it when they do that, that, that no child left behind. Man, I hate it when they do that national health care. And we fume. We've never stood consistently at that line as states together in this fashion. As we do that and build that record, then we don't have to get on the iPad and research a long train of abuses. We've built our resolve, we've built the record, it becomes inevitable what needs to be done. Then there are efforts to legislate, to litigate, and perhaps even amend the Constitution that are powers given to the states to take control. Now think of how simple it is though. Fifteen trillion dollar problem and it takes ten people to elect your representative who's the sure guardian of your liberty. I challenge you all to find ten. I challenge you all to find ten. We've got some some flyers on this. I've written a book that talks about the rights, the powers, the duties of the states. We've got it here. It's Where's the Line, How States Protect the Constitution. We're, we've formed a foundation to get out into the states and teach legislators. So legislators become educators on the proper role of government to build and rally the people as we stand as that external check and restore that balance. Because if we don't, where does it end? Government does what it can. Unchecked government does what it can. Is 15 trillion the line? Is 43% consuming 43% of our children's future the line? Well, it's beyond the line for me. And I've put everything on the line to do this because we're so far beyond that. Um, let me just leave you with this. We can do this because it is systemic. We don't need to hit each other over the head with left and right clubs any longer. We simply need to work on the system. Once we've restored the system, let's have great debates in the proper jurisdiction. When we're talking about brownies in school, now the FDA controls whether or not you can do bake sales in schools. Did you know that? I don't care if it's a Republican or a Democrat administration. It's going to be a stupid decision if they're deciding bake sales in the schools. Once we've restored jurisdiction, let's have a great debate at the proper level. Let's have a great debate. We can do this. Let me leave you with this. I mentioned this this morning. This is Ronald Reagan from 1985. This is a wonderful time to be alive. We're lucky not to live in pale and timid times. We've been blessed with the opportunity to stand for something, for liberty and freedom and fairness and these are things worth fighting for, worth devoting our lives to. So let us go forth with good cheer and stout hearts, happy warriors, out to seize back a country and a world to freedom. Thank you.